Number 116, Grimclaw Tigrex. This is probably a hot take, but Grimclaw is my favorite deviant from base generations. I mean, all but one of the GU deviants I find to be better, but still. Grimclaw mainly emphasizes Tigrex's physical strength as opposed to Brute's emphasis on the roar, and I think they pull it off very well. I love how they're strong enough to cause the ground to physically erupt around them. That massive rock scoop that they can combo into after one of their charges is a terrifying move if you don't know how to dodge it and is a major reason why I didn't like Grimclaw that much, but just learned the moveset and how to actually dodge the attack made it far more enjoyable. Go figure. I also like how they repurpose moves from Brute without using them identically, like being able to combo different moves out of their stomping charge. I'm not sure which I prefer, Grimclaw or Iceborne's Brute Tigrex, but these two are both in the running for my favorite version of the monster. Four out of five. My favoritest monster of all time. It takes all the best traits of Tigrex and amplifies them, as well as giving it new traits such as Steam and let's be real here, I just like him because he's cool. Five stars, this is my favorite Deviant. The name alone, Grimclaw, is so awesome. It's very similar to Bloodbath, but it mainly came down to the monster's design. I definitely prefer Tigrex over Diabolus's core shape. Sporting a lot more blue and even having blue veins when unenraged, while Brute and Molten focus mostly on roaring. Grimclaw gets a lot of ranged attack upgrades and melee options, seeing him slamming his paws with all of his might into the ground, cracking it and creating a giant steam explosion is so metal. And then you add in like the giant boulders as well. He's dangerous both close and at a range. This is what I wanted from Tigrex. Farming him was such a pain and so amazing at the same time. His gear was worth everything. He reminds me a lot of Diorexu from Frontier, but obviously not quite as bad insane as that. How was Capcom able to do a monster that I genuinely didn't like in its regular form so well three times in a row? As a great sword main in Generations and GU, I grinded him a ton and for so long to max out the armor and greatsword in high rank and loved basically every part of it. My only complaint is that the majority of maps you fight him in are way too small for him and especially his giant hitboxes. Number 115. This next entry will be handed off to the best and brightest when it comes to speculative monster ecology. Unnatural History Channel will be introducing Raffian. Hello, I'm the Unnatural History Channel. You may know me from my videos taking theoretical looks at monster ecology, broader topics in the series, or videos on other media featuring big lizards. And now I'm here for a good old gush about a few of my faves. Rathian is truly a monster that doesn't get enough love. Tell someone you actually like Rathian, and you're probably going to get a disparaging remark about her lack of fight updates, and her being a bit of a punching bag. And whilst those aren't necessarily wrong, and I'd like to see Rathian considerably updated too, I think the role of the leisure hunt is an understated one. When you forge a new weapon or want to get back into the swing of things, swatting flies just isn't sufficient for a hunt. And you also generally don't want to go all out on whatever the most recent challenge is in that playthrough. Thusly, monsters like Rathian provide the perfect stomping ground for the ancient art of actually just enjoying yourself in Monster Hunter. A bit of a forgotten art in the modern meta of optimization and speedruns. There's a reason you always go to her to break in a new weapon. And for all the mockery, Rathian really is a monster like the ceiling or a tooth or air. No one compliments it whilst it's there, but you can be certain they'd notice its absence once it's gone. If she was a terrible hunt, no matter how easy, no one would be using her for anything. There are plenty of positives that are pretty genuine too. The backflip will never not be iconic, the gold version can generally provide the greater challenge people may be looking for, and Rathian's always had pretty stylish gear, often in the theme of a classic fantasy knight. Fitting then, for a monster who at her core and in her design, is perhaps the original monster huntification of the classic fantasy dragon, big, green and angry. Because, for an unapologetic nerd like me, the true meat is perhaps outside the gameplay for Rathian. For one, I think Rathian really carries the theme of monster hunter and it's turn away from typical fantasy into a more restrained, grounded and ecological reading. Rathian doesn't sit on a hoard of treasure, she guards her nest, just like Vermithrax did. 
Rathion isn't a species, it's a sex. She's the female counterpart to the male Rathalos. Her ecology video isn't some hyperglazed fight, it's her feeding her chicks. Rathion really is a monster that carries the ideals that set Monster Hunter apart in her very DNA. Rathion's lore is generally excellent, and her wide range often means she stars in a number of competitive interactions with other monsters, be they in cutscene or turf wars. Rathion rarely wins such interactions, but with so many of them across multiple habitats, she enriches the world everyone else lives in too. She just generally makes for a more interesting place to be. From a behavioural ecology standpoint, she's also one of the most interesting monsters due to her relationship with or without Rathalos. She's still plenty interesting as a mated individual, due to the success of their species and their parental care, but the struggle of Rathians who have to go it alone in the notably different environments of deserts or jungles makes for a fascinating comparison, and pretty rich grounds for theorising. There's a reason they've got two videos and multiple large roles in the broader topics series. Rathian could be improved. I'd like a meteor fight, to see more of the mother bear angle rather than the punching bag angle, and hope that in wilds she may get more interactions with Rathalos. Because she is still one half of a whole, but arguably the half that handles itself better alone. Rathian can survive without their mate, that's a big chunk of their personality. But if Rathalos wants to follow his biological imperative, he needs her. Because after all, a king is nothing without a queen. She's a very reliable low mid-tier monster, looks imposing to every new hunter, but has a clearly seen moveset to learn against and triumph over during the journey. Plus the idea of a dragon backflipping is just really fun with a nice traditional wife and design as the first ever monster created. 3 out of 5. Very good design. Not quite 5 star, but a nice minimalist dragon looking wyvern with a nice balance of detail and simplicity. It is also one of the first monsters in the series to actually focus on ecology, with it guarding the nest while Rathalos hunts and all that. It pretty much feels like the default monster to me. If I could, I would give it 4.75 stars, but the poll is limited to 5 options. While not one of my personal absolute favourites, no one can deny that it was a shining beacon of quality and a nice baseline for a good monster in the midst of all the jokes and boring raptors Gen 1 had to offer. She's not in my top 10, but legitimately 5 stars. She and Rathalos are everything Monster Hunter strives to be. For her tier, Rathian has one of the best fights, and both Raths have unmatched quality in their biology and ecology. They're both spectacularly created monsters. Rathian is an amazing wall for beginners, testing them on multiple things like going for her tail to nullify her poison attacks, using antidote to heal from her poison attacks, being patient and waiting for the perfect opportunity to hit her, knocking her down with flash bombs when she's flying, and some such things like that plus her design and sound effects and ecology definitely put her up there as a great beginner monster. Number 114, Darren Moran. Four stars, about the same gameplay as Gen Moran from Try, but with a better design and is a really cool way to start off the game. A really fun siege fight, used to grind this guy for Xenium, loved it. Lots of things to do, lots of ways to beat it, and when you find a new part to break that you didn't know you could before, it's a wonderful feeling, and this guy's got a couple of really obscure part breaks, more than you'd think. It's great so far, but I think it could have had some real potential to go even further. For all my joy, I do gotta give it a 5. Also, it's got great armor, both in terms of skills and look, you can die it pretty well. I prefer Gen, design-wise, but by no means do I dislike Darren. I like the big spikes it launches from its blowhole and it's quite intimidating when it's about to dive in horn first into the ship. 3.75 stars, round that up to 4. I think he looks a little cooler than Jen, but I don't think that he does what Jen does any better, so he's a little less iconic for it. I would rather get Jen back if I had to choose, but if they chose Darren instead for some reason, I'd still be happy, especially if they made him into some kind of variant or subspecies like they kind of did with Crimson Glow Volstrax. 5 out of 5 for me, I'm most likely in the minority in this, but this is my favorite sand whale monster of the two that exist. I personally prefer the narwhal horn sort of look over the dual tusk look on Jen. Sometimes less is more. Number 113, Shrouded Nursula. Five stars, this is one of my favorite old gen subs. She hunts Kezu, automatically four stars. Looks really cool and actually fits the desert because, you know, 
burrowing spiders. She defies the laws of physics and works on Spider-Man 2 web mechanics, the old Spider-Man 2. Them webs just kind of be connecting the thin air. Makes absolutely no sense, but I, I, can, I can forgive it. Noxious Poison and Paralysis is a mean combo, but it works. She attacks from above and now also from below. While she loses the uniqueness of the dedicated map zones, she makes up for it with a very fun fight. I hope this is one of the old subspecies that can be preserved Reserved for the future. Only a very minor element change on this subspecies, but it's still pulled off really well by differentiating the monster in other areas, namely the digging and the swinging. Although I think that everyone who's fought this thing has the question, what the f swinging from? But if she returns in wilds or in a future game, they could probably just make it so that she can only swing from certain parts of the environment. Great design, great hunt, great everything. Just fix the swinging up a little bit. Five stars. Pretty cool! I don't remember Shrouded super well, but the burrowing and desert environment is always something I thought was pretty neat. Changing the skin coat to Kezu is perfect in every way, and the colors look excellent. My main memory of Shrouded was only getting hit twice on my first hunt against it, which made me feel incredibly cool. Four stars from me. I'm gonna give her four stars. I really like Shrouded Nursula's design. I like the thought of Shrouded just being a Nursula that hunts Kezu and would totally take her as a shiny Pokemon type of spawn. I love the gear, love the fights, and how she fights a bit like an ant lion. But the reason I'm bumping her down, even though I really wanna give her a five, is the ecology aspect. First, her having paralysis crystals doesn't make sense. A normal Nursula, it comes from her excreting substance from her prey. In the case of Gypsros, who has a poison poisonous fluid, but Kezu paralysis comes from electricity, not venom. So the crystallized stuff on her back doesn't really make any sense. Second issue is habitat. Kezu lives in swamps and cold climates while Shrouded lives in the desert. How does that work? She should be wearing Genprey and Cephadrome hide. Number 112, Desert Celtus Queen. Okay, imagine being a desert Celtus, just sleeping in the sand and then this thing pulls you out essentially mind controls you and once you've served your purpose throws you like a missile where you then shatter on the ground desert celtus queen cares even less about how many celtus she has to go through to defeat you and i think she's a pretty successful subspecies five stars she is a truly cruel sovereign of the sands her subjects sleep peacefully beneath the dunes praying not to feel the sting of her tail as they know that if they do their end is upon them one evolution of the fight i I would love to see, particularly with this attack, is for them to run with the whole shattered insect animation by making this attack include shrapnel on impact, so it's more likely to hit. This fight is such a cool alternate take on the monster and one of the better pre-fifth generation subspecies. The first time it killed its own desert celtus in attack was such a surprise for me. I was like, whoa! That really just happened. The fight is just really fun in general as well. It honestly feels less like a subspecies to me, a little bit more like a variant. Whenever I feel like I want to fight Celtus Queen, I would probably go for the desert version because it's just a better fight in my opinion. Normal Celtus Queen is already five stars for me and this just makes her better, still five stars. Desert Celtus Queen is an asshole. Her whole gimmick is that she doesn't even pretend to like the Desert Celtus. She'll just yeet him across the zone at you and then grab another one from underneath the sand. At least regular Celtus Queen eating her mate was a last resort. Desert just kinda does it whenever. We've only seen a desert environment for wilds so far, but Desert Celtus Queen would fit there perfectly as the cruel ruler of the sands. Five stars. Instead of spending any time with the Celtus as a combo tank, it just yeets them within seconds before going and just grabbing another one. Absolutely hilarious. Five out of five. Number 111, Tigrex. Tigrex is really awesome. You take the most famous, well-known extinct predator, merge it with one of the most famous modern day predators, and add a little bit of that monster to spice, and then you have one of the best monsters of all time. Much like the Blos Wyverns, Tigrex is just cool. I really don't need to say much else. He's just awesome. He's the living personification of guys will look at this and just say, hell yeah. You take the most well-known and feared prehistoric predator, Tyrannosaurus Rex, mix that with a tiger, add a little bit of freight train in there, and boom, you got 
peak flagship design. Going into more depth in its design, it definitely leans more towards the T-Rex side of things with the massive reptilian head and maw, spines running down its back, and the long powerful tail. The tiger aspect then comes into play with its coloration, the light orange and blue stripes obviously mimicking a tiger stripe pattern, and with its large, extremely powerful forelimbs, which allows it to launch itself across great distances, hold down larger prey, and fling boulders and chunks of ice at oppressors. Its theme is great too, especially that Iceborne version, where they turned it into a horror or thrill movie score. The sudden crashes of percussion and blasts of trumpet and trombone really tie the whole overwhelmingly powerful, intimidating apex predator of the tundra field together, and it definitely is in my top 10 flagships. I give Tigrex a 5 out of 5. I think Tigrex is a fantastic example of the creativity and uniqueness of the Monster Hunter series, a primordial creature that is related to a classification of monsters defined by their abilities of flight and large, well-developed wings. But unlike the Blow Swiverns, who simply don't use them, the Tigrex wings are one of its greatest tools. Not as wings, but as powerful legs, capable of wreaking horrific destruction against anything in its path. Five out of five, Tigrex is one of the most unique monsters in the series, and I think he showcases the creative force that is this series fantastically. My beloved, he grew on me so much over the years. He's become my top two monster. The design is simply phenomenal. I love the concept. I love fighting him. I love his ecology and I love what he represents. As many of his quest names like to remind you, he is absolute power. Although more changes to his combat in the form of a moveset upgrade would be welcomed, his core is so solid that I simply can't not love him. 10 out of 10. Great design, but the fight sometimes falls victim to the runs at you and then turns around and runs at you again curse. I think Tigrex is a five star. He's a very simple idea, but a pretty flawless execution of said idea. A T-Rex wyvern that has arms the size of a car that constantly charges back and forth, and its roar is loud enough to murder a man. Not many bells and whistles, but he doesn't need them. And while he isn't one of my favorites, I have no qualms with him. Number 110, Xeno Jiva. World absolutely cooked with its final bosses, and Xeno is no exception. It's the oldest of the four fifth generation bosses, so recency bias means it's often the most overhated one, which I find ludicrous. Some people have gripes with the fight, arguing it's clunky and awkward. That's the point. Others think that the music is half baked and incomplete. That's the point. And others think that Nergigante is cooler. That's the point. Xeno's visual and audio design is incredible. Well done to get to the point across to the player that they're hunting a baby. Aside from the incredibly striking and straight up alien appearance, it doesn't know what it's doing. It's just throwing itself at you desperately and instinctively and slowly learning what it can do over the course of the hunt. Its music starts off incredibly uncanny and out of tune, just like the creature itself. And over the course of the quest, it slowly gains structure and confidence along with the monster itself, who gains new attacks and begins to form more complex combinations too. My favorite touch is that Xenojiva actually attempts and fails to absorb energy from its surroundings within the hunt. An amazing hint at what its true nature is. That's honestly kind of genius in hindsight. Five out of five, absolutely cinema. He's all right. His appearance is definitely interesting to behold, and his fight mechanic of slowly becoming better the longer you fight is kind of sick, but otherwise, he's not boring, but kind of simple. Not that it's bad. I love simple monsters, but I love them because simplicity is a good form of restraint, and we breathe creativity through restraint. Xeno doesn't do a lot of creative stuff besides his appearance. That will end up being subverted with his older sibling, Safi, which is cool. Main problem is this fight. It's pretty cinematic, but it ends up kind of being boring and attacking janky of a slog to get through again. His size makes it really hard for most weapons to be properly effective. His arena kind of sucks some of the fun out of the usual world maps, and the occasional time he takes flight, the majesty stops after like five seconds and I just have to dodge apologizingly slow beams and drive-bys until he lands a whole minute later. Literally the Gen 1 Rathalos problem, but less clunky than that, still really enjoy it, still a very enjoyable experience compared to other Elder Dragons of base world, Nergi and Vol notwithstanding. Lore's pretty good too, the music's great, overall a good final boss, but I think the worst of 5th generation, nonetheless he's still a pretty good monster, with a 4 out of 5. A 
don't like how much people hate on Zeno, but I can't blame them. Undeniably, his fight isn't very good, which especially sucks because he holds the weight of being a final boss. I will say, he probably has one of my favorite designs, of having very clear alien inspirations, yet takes the shape of a familiar dragon, which creates a neat contrast. I gotta give points to his arch-tempered fight also. Honestly, that is one of my favorite fights in base world. Would have been great if his base form put up a real fight, so three stars is the best I'm gonna give him. Honestly, I don't see any issues with the fights. It does seem a little underwhelming for a final boss. When I finally slayed it my first time, I was kind of surprised when the credits rolled, but compared to any other monster in the game, it is a perfectly fine battle. Plus the design is incredibly otherworldly and I really like that. So a four out of five. I look at Zeno and think, hell yes. I fight Zeno and I think, all right. And then I think about every other final boss, big evil I fought in the series before and after. And sadly, despite my long fondness for his design, Zeno Jiva falls a little short of the others. Don't get me wrong, it's still good. And I can sort of forgive the lackluster elements because it's the first fight of its kind that they made for games of the higher fidelity and newer engine and all that kind of stuff about world, blah, 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 blah. I really like its theme though. Like really, really enjoy it even more than Soft and fatalities, despite not being my favorite and a slight, and I mean slight, let down, Xenojiva still earns four stars from me. Number 109, Glacial Agnactor. One of the best subspecies in the series, extremely slept on since most of the community hasn't played the older games. Honestly, he's up there with Stygian in terms of really pushing subspecies forward during the third generation. I really hope Agnactor comes back in a future entry soon, so that this great subspecies can have a chance to shine even brighter. Genuinely one of the best subspecies ever, and maybe my third favorite monster ever. All the good things about Agnactor are here, only element swapped to ice, and the armor gives gimmick is reversed. It might be a simple change, but it's an effective one, so a 5 star from me. I also hope he gets little glacial Aroctors to go with him. Small monster subspecies would be a really nice touch. Glacial Ignactor is the premier subspecies, not only inverting the element from fire to ice, but inverting the armor mechanics, so that the armor softens the longer Glacial Ignactor is out of the ground. It's genius. He does suffer from some of the same neglect that Agnactor gets, but even more so since Glacial wasn't in GU, but there's a reason the Icy Clack Clack is a fan favorite. One of few subspecies to rise above their base form for me, and not just because I have a soft spot for ice monsters, five stars. Four stars. Kind of annoying at the beginning due to the solid ice armor, except for the chest, but it gets simpler once the ice armor melts and or you break three or four armor parts. One of the best subspecies ever. He's so cool. Did you know that if he starts going underground on clear ice, you can see the outline of him under it? Goaded fight, because he feels like Gravios. Breaking an enemy down piece by piece is probably one of my favorite things about Monster Hunter. 10 out of 10. Also, doesn't get stuck out of reach out in the lava like a normal Agnactor can. Number 108, Tetronodon. Underrated in my opinion, he's a low tier monster that really deserves his flowers. He's got a pretty good fight design for where he stands in the hierarchy of both the Frost Islands and the Shrine Ruins. I personally think his inflation mechanic works better than Zamtrios's. The early game damage holds him back from being a serious wall, but I think the fact that most of his moveset revolves around moves that inflict stun so that he can body slam you is a really fun way to get players to learn his moveset. Four out of five. Honestly, a great starting monster. It's cute. What is it with these 5-gen monsters being cute across the board? Cool, and it's a platypus. Come on now, it's a platypus. The fight is pretty good as well. I wouldn't hesitate calling this my favorite amphibian. Afflicted blood is useful too, so I fought it quite a bit for that reason. Extremely good thematically, very clearly inspired by a Kappa sumo wrestler, yet looks right at home in his natural environment. Love his sounds and his personality, he's a great early game fight that teaches players to wirefall or else get smushed. Basically, a perfect monster for what he is. 5 out of 5. If any one of the yokai monsters are making it out of Rise and into the main series moving forward, I think this is the one. He's similar to some monsters like Zamtrios and Gobel, but I think that's what he has going for him, because we just about always will have some form of jungle map that he can get into. I thought it was really weird when Rise put him in the Frost Islands, but I think he can work on a variety of maps so long as his green camouflage allows it to make sense that he's there. He has a really fun fight, and I'd be keen to see it adapted to games that don't 
don't have all the tools that Rise gave us. One thing about Rise is that it has fantastic early game monsters, and Tetra is just one of the best. I love his fights and multiple stages, he's got an extremely varied moveset that is full of personality, and it's not a wyvern. No complaints from me. Number 107, Ivory Lagiacris. I really love Ivory Laggy so much. His design looks so good, and the fight's really fun. Somehow being more simple is what makes Ivory so much more memorable to me over that GU version of Laggy. Plus, in the story, he's the old rival of the Moga Chief, and defeating him serves as a passing of the torch in a way, which as a kid always made me feel like I'd finally become a true resident of Moga. Five stars, it's still Lagiacris. Ivory was the first subspecies I was really looking forward to fighting. It ended up taking me two weeks to actually slay it. His landlock fighting style is pretty good and doesn't feel like a Kezu, but stronger. Awesome color swap and my main monster in Stories 1. He is one of my favorite monster variants. I remember using him to try and grind laggy sapphires in 3U to make his armor, which I am still using in G-Rank. I got so good at fighting him that there was a point where he just couldn't touch me. That was probably the most satisfying moment in my Monster Hunter career, being able to trounce Ivory Legiacris, which used to intimidate me. 10 out of 10 monster. I wish he was in GU instead of normal Legiacris. Sure, Generations has no subspecies, but it would have made more sense, kind of like how Rise has Crimson Glow Fall Strax and not the normal one. If Legiacris is in Wilds, I think I would prefer it to be Ivory, since they probably won't have underwater combat. I know Laggy one third, but Ivory just works better on land due to his increased size. And unlike GU Laggy, his AI likes to be much more physical as opposed to just spamming ranged attacks. Playing through 3U, I was shocked to realize that Ivory was the real main monster of the game compared to the story-irrelevant Brachydeos. I was also shocked uh -huh, at just how much stronger and more difficult it was than the normal Legiacris, handing me my first serious defeats. Despite getting crushed, I never got frustrated with the game like I would for a number of other monsters. A lot of Ivory feels more like a rare species than a normal species, and I'm all here for it. I hope it returns and is done justice for being one of the strongest, if not the strongest non-elder subspecies out there. Five stars. Underrated, I really don't dig the color scheme that much in isolation, but it's great as a variation of Legiacris. The moveset is pretty fun and very scary. Only knock against him is he appears in the worst quest I have ever played in any game, Mark of a Hero. But there, he isn't even the issue, so five stars. Number 106, Goldbeard Sidaeus. A solid improvement which completely cuts out the janky, boring first phase and gets straight to the point. Plus, he looks good in gold, and the armor set is amazing both looks and skill-wise. Five stars, alongside his base species. The gold isn't my favorite, but I'm glad the highlights are still there. Regulus Aeneas back in Village was preparing you to fight Goldbeard. There's no DPS carryover, you have to slay him within that 50 minute time frame. When I went into this fight, I was terrified that this would be a battle I had to be carried through by other hunters. I had learned more since my original Aeneas fight, like how to dodge sidestep underwater though. Throughout my first kill, I was praying that my higher rank Bracky Switch Axe would be enough Enough that my set was enough. I managed to finish him with only a few minutes left on the clock. That proved to me that I was great at 3U switch axe and underwater combat, that I was ready for G rank. He's a very solid upgrade to Sidaeus. Both horns being breakable is probably the most satisfying thing ever. It skips the annoying first phase, making it even more fun. He's lacking that special oomph though, don't get me wrong. He's amazing, but he's lacking something. Can't put my finger on it though. He lands very solidly in the four star category, great monster. Cutting out the first phase, giving a better recolor, and making the horns huge was just what Sidaeus needed to make me look past the less interesting parts of his fight and give him a 5 out of 5. I like him less than normal Sidaeus, mainly because I had to grind a lot for his armor, and I had to do it solo because 3DS online servers were down by then. I also hate his attack when he swims to the top of the arena and shoots a water beam down at you. I can't figure out how you're supposed to dodge that for the life of me. The main thing he has over normal Sidaeus is that he starts in the second phase, which is much appreciated. But yeah, three stars for me, which is one less than the normal Sidaeus. Number 105, Elder Frost Gameth. People say 
that Gareth needs an improved fight if she returns, and I obviously agree. But honestly, Elder Frost already kinda nailed the fight. I'd say that she goes just a tad bit overboard with the AoE attacks, but otherwise, I think Elder Frost Gameth is just a straight up better Gameth. If normal Gameth were to inherit some of its Deviant's moveset, just like Astalos did in Sunbreak, you definitely wouldn't see me complaining. Gameth is only held back from 5 stars because of her fight, but Elder Frost fixes that issue, so 5 stars. This is probably one of the only Deviants to actually get a higher score than its base monster from me. Elder Frost Gameth is simple, yet brilliant. Simply an older, crankier Gameth who covers herself in spiked ice rather than snow. The sharpened tusks and cracked crest simply are proof of her might, and the many battles she has won. Thematically one of the coolest monsters, literally bringing the mountain down upon you. Would love to see Monster Hunter's second greatest grandma come back. Five stars. Going against Bolt Reaver for my least favorite Deviant. Unfortunately, many of its weapons were quite good, so I spent a heck of a lot of time fighting her. More than I ever would have liked to. Personally, found many of its AoE snow attacks to not be very intuitive in their range or active frames based on the visuals, which is my main gripe with this fight. At least it managed to make Gameth not a complete pushover. I had the urge to give it a 2, but realistically it's not that bad, so 3 it is. For me, Elder Frost is really cool, but also has a lot of missed potential. The ice armor plays no role in the fight, they could have made it so that the ice spikes shoot out and cause bleed. The fight is largely the same, and honestly, could have been worked into the normal Gameth fight. Very little ice is on the feet, and there's none on the tusks or the crest. They could have given the Queen of the Tundra, like, a actual ice crown. For my rating, awesome, but a lot of missed potential out of 10. Gameth, my beloved, is already my number one monster out of them all, and Elder Frost Gameth kicked it up for me by a mile. She was already this beautiful encapsulation of power and somewhat elegance in the way she fights, and Elder Frost feels like the next kind of push to take that fight to the next level. I always love the design, how the ice doesn't just read as armor but reads as age and as a hardened member of the species who's toughed it out through enough battles and conflicts that she comes off like the literal interpretation of the phrase stone cold. Many say Gamma's fight needs to be touched up upon if she were to ever be brought back, and I definitely feel merit by that and agree in some regard, but I will also say that Elder Frost provides an interesting kind of battle where paying attention to how long your attacks last could be life or death. If you get hit by one of her attacks and contract Ice Blight, reducing your stamina and turn your ability to run away, her huge attacks have a much better chance of hitting you, and all that kind of complements itself really well. And don't even get me started on Elder Frost EX either. I still get shivers thinking about that fight's endurance and patience. But through all that, she stands as my number one. Number 104, Crimson Fatalis. Definitely the most underwhelming of the three Fatalises, the Crimson Demon in MH4U is easily his best representation, and then they just removed it in GU. If anybody needs a glow up, it's this dude. We'll never forget the sheer power of his weapons in MH4U. You could not escape people in Star Knight armor with Crimson Fatalis weapons anywhere. Three stars. That special Crimson Fatalis event quest is one of the quests I did with Random Hunters before the 3DS shut down their servers, and I'll tell ya, it's a spectacle, especially when fighting with new I can't wait for him to undergo the same treatment Iceborne Fatalis got, and especially my favorite of the trio, the old Fatalis. I actually really like the potential this monster gives to Fatalis in general. It shows that even a seemingly unnatural monster like Fatalis is still just that. A monster that can change with its surroundings like any other, just to a horrifying degree. Dude can literally call down meteors. To this day, I don't think any mainline monster can do that. Only Behemoth, right? Kind of the awkward middle child of the Fatalis trio, but still one of them at the end of the day. Four stars. Concept, looks, and abilities are all five stars, but his fight is still stuck in Fatalis' past. Once he gets the Iceborne treatment, he'll be in easy five stars. Three stars. Sadly, Crimson Fatalis is kind of boring. The fight is a super cool setting, and the additional blast later on does change things a bit, but overall, it just doesn't do much super different from the regular Fatalis. Also, being stuck in the old games does not help, as the fight is much less dynamic and suffers from the more limited moveset and presentation. Number 103, Monoblos. Monoblos's lore with the Kokoto Chief is still absolute peak. My first five out of five. 
definitely cooler than Diablo's because of the Styracosaurus aspect, which they brought him back, but lore-wise, they're apparently pretty rare. I absolutely adore Motoblos. I like his more traditionally Ceratopsian skull, the blood patterns in his rage mode are super unique and exciting, and I'm desperately hoping that he can use Zerp Diablos in wilds. His Kinjep attack and stories also endeared me to him even more because of that sort of classic anime dash attack reference and his role in Monster Hunter as the master of duels and 1v1s. My favorite Gen 1 monster by far. Enjoyable fight alongside Diablo, super cool design, dope equipment. Wish he'd come back, I'd unironically trade Diablos for Monoblos in Wilds. I've come to the realization that I think Gen 1's monsters are pretty lackluster, but Monoblos is an absolute gem. I love the cultural significance in games about Monoblos. How he is a test that separated good hunters from great hunters, and I appreciate the design, but I don't like that it's one of those monsters that Capcom seems to think of as an afterthought. And honestly, I love how its crest turns blood red when it's enraged. I think he's a great monster. I think his design is amazing. I think the concept behind him is cool. And I think his lore is awesome. But his fight is basically the same as Diablos' fight. I think if he was given the Lunastra treatment, he'd be close to perfection. Until then, I'm going to give him a four star. Number 102, Toby Kadachi. This guy is my favorite monster, my number one. I love his design, I love his fights, and I love his ecology. I love how well his ecology melds into his battle with him jumping onto the trees to charge himself and him retreating up into his nest, which is just such a cool arena for him that takes full advantage of his movement. The only complaint I have is that I don't like how Rise just kind of plopped him in the flooded forest with no real thought and ignored the fun ecology and the tree hopping and all that that I really love about his fights. But in world, at least, this guy is the best. Easiest 5 out of 5 on the whole list. One of the best early monsters. Love his design, his color scheme, his fight. Cute but threatening, and thunder monsters are always welcomed in my book. Tobikodachi is near perfect. Entirely locked to the ancient forest, they make the most of it by jumping between trees and taking shortcuts that other monsters don't. It really feels like this creature has perfectly adapted for the canopies and is now taking those adaptations to beat you over the head. It's to the point that seeing him outside of dense forests feels a little out of place, but I'd gladly get used to it if it means seeing Toby become a series regular. Five stars. Really solid monster. For base world's only thunder monster, they knocked it out of the park. Visually stunning, a giant blue snake squirrel that has great interactions where he bounces off of walls and stuff, and a real joy to hunt. Five out of five. It's actually my favorite monster of all time, and I've been playing since Try. He is everything that makes this series so awesome. He's a mix of different animals that's almost believable. You could imagine him living millions of years ago. Ecology is really detailed and looks wicked realistic. When I first saw him in a trailer, I was immediately hooked, and he did not disappoint. I wanted to meet that creature, and it also doesn't hurt that he has my favorite color. Too bad his weapons and armor kind of suck, but he he makes up for them with such a unique design and ecology. Number 101, Risen Kushala Daora. The best version of Kushala Daora. The scars across its body that light up beautifully when it powers up look marvelous. The horns taking on that same glow are awesome. Then, like all the Risen Elders, the fight is a huge step up in quality and savagery. The new attacks Risen Kushala picks up give it way more options, but none of them feel overly punishing, and the Golden Tornadoes are fantastic. Five stars. My favorite of the Risen Monsters, and my favorite Kushala, a beefed out version of Ryze's amazing moveset, piled onto that gorgeous orange glow that almost looks like red hot steel. Makes for an amazing hunt. Five out of five. Risen Kashala is another amazing Risen. The design changes are like all the others, and on Kashala they look excellent. The Golden Wind is especially beautiful. The fight is a great upgrade to Ryze's already fantastic Kashala fight. The Wind Paw Slams are incredibly fun, and the additional combos and ultimates are great as well. Risen Kashala is about the middle ground for the Risens, not as spectacular as the two at the top, but a certain step up from the other trio members. Honestly, all of them are fantastic on their own anyway. Fun Five out of five. Risen Kashala continues the trend of Risen monsters being amazing. Not only does it have a notably different appearance, I love the pink, but the fight also underwent a total upgrade. The shadow upon the Tempest really had a glow up in Rise Break. 
First, its fight becomes really fun, and then it gets an awesome new form. This is the superior Kashala variation, no questions about it. As I said, most every part of Kashala's fight has been an upgrade in its rise form. It's got new wind attacks, new physical attacks, enhanced wind attacks, it's got all that, and some of those moves are really cool. The wind paw slams, for example, are something I just hope is a part of the core moveset from now on. The golden wind is great too. Kashala already had a black variant, so another color makes a lot of sense. It also shows how much more powerful he has become. The after explosions are on the same level of Amatsu's old super moves. It's honestly really cool to see. And then when it goes risen, the aesthetic becomes even better. In my opinion, Kushala has the second best risen design out of all the Elder Dragons. And that design is beautifully translated into its gear. I was very surprised at how different the armor looks. It looks way cooler than the regular Kashala gear. Red and black is always a great mix, and the helmet specifically is awesome. Wind Mantle, like all the new Risen skills, is really interesting to play around with. It lets you spam more Silk Binds, if you're already spamming the Silk Binds, and lets you stay really aggressive. One slot decos for Kashala's Blessing is also very nice. So yeah, I think Risen Kashala definitely lives up to the precedent set by Camellios a title update prior. It's my favorite version of this monster by quite a margin, and I hope some of what makes it great gets picked up by the normal Kashala the next time he returns. Rise Kashala is already a league more enjoyable fight than the world or the old Kashala, and this version completely makes up for whatever the f AT Kashala was. Also, Wind Mantle is a hilarious skill because two points of it adds a third wire bug, lets dual blades infinitely chain the spiral slices.